On leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told Jesus about her. He approached, grasped her hand, and helped her up. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. When it was evening after sunset, they brought to Jesus all who were ill or possessed by demons. The whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him, and on finding him said, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus told him, Let us go to the nearby villages <coughs> that I may preach there also. For this purpose I have come. So he went into their synagogues preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. As you noted in the opening prayer, we're using the Mass for our Lord Jesus Christ, eternal high priest today, as is suggested in the Ordo. Twice this week now, uh, it's been suggested that we use the votive Mass for the sick. I chose the Mass of Jesus, eternal high priest, um, because I think that includes the ministry of Jesus for the sick. The first reading refers to the one, the Mass we chose, and the second reading would imply that it's chosen for the healing of the sick. The power of Jesus to heal, which is essentially, well, absolutely, his compassion, his mercy, and his desire, reveals the power and authority of God in him. It reveals his divinity. And the sign of his ability to heal is... Um, are evidences or signs of the coming kingdom. God wants us whole, not ill, but that's the reality of our human bodies. The first reading, at least in my understanding and reading, is a little confusing. Since the children share in blood and flesh, flesh is always capitalized. I'm not sure why. Presumably because of the flesh of Christ, the Incarnation, the Divine One who became human. But why isn't blood capitalized? The precious blood of the Lamb. Sacrifice I do not desire. A body I have prepared for you. It goes on again. The th notice the thread of the Incarnation. Again, we're flowing through, through or from the work of the Christmas season. Christmas, Epiphany, the baptism of the Lord. And now, in ordinary daily life, we are people of the flesh, and yet we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus likewise shared in them, us, that through death he might destroy the one who has power, the power of death, that is, the devil. People will often ask, well, why did God become human? And more often, why did Jesus have to suffer? Jesus became human because we're human, and it is in our flesh and in our bodies and our creature nature out of which or through which we need to be saved. It's another expression of the unitive life of God. It's not a theological statement, but it's correct to say that there is an unending oneness with in God, the Trinity, and in us with God through Christ in the Spirit. You have a oneness with God. We would not have that, nor could we have it, if God in Jesus did not become incarnate, accepting our flesh. 
big leap from heaven to earth, but Jesus, I suppose, had somewhat of a soft landing. And now we, with him, are called to share and invite, uh, invited to share the eternal glory. Because he himself was tested through what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested, those who also suffer. Jesus suffered because we suffer. He came to be human to share our lot. He never sinned, but he took on all sin. He knew and understood what it means to sin because it, he took it into his own person, his personality, his nature, which was mediated or mitigated, expiated, forgiven, by his divine nature. God is greater than human beings and yet became one so that we could become aware of that to which we are being called, eternal life, life with God. It plays out, again, in two expressions of the life of Jesus. On the one hand, we have his, his act of life, his compassion. Literally, Jesus is the compassion of God. I make the point again for those who might find it difficult, for instance, to have a relationship with the Father, God is Father. Remember, Jesus says, the one who sees me sees the Father. Jesus is that image, God with flesh. To see Jesus is to see and to know the Father. So on the one hand, we see the activity of God in the person of Christ, compassion, ministry, daily work, in his interest or care or compassion to heal uh, and uh, Peter and Andrew's mother, Peter's mother-in-law. <clears throat> Notice the human, the, um, human uh, expressions here. He immediately went to her, and they immediately told him about her. He approached and grasped her hand. And that's not just a minor detail. Jesus does that often. He touched the woman who was hemorrhaging for 12 years. He touched lepers. It did not bother him to do that. Whereas the religious establishment would say, he touched a sinner, he's unclean. We have to put him out and put him outside the, the circle of those who are worthy of God or, or breakers of the law and unworthy of God. He's not just being kind, he's showing the compassion of God. He takes her hand and helps her up. He didn't lift her up all by himself. Notice, again, these subtle connections. Jesus never says, I heal you. Get up. Your faith has saved you. Take your mat and go home. Do not be afraid. Your faith has saved you. He helped her. She participated in the, in the healing by having faith in him. She allowed him to heal her, in a sense, sounds sort of patriarchal, but she allowed the healing by receiving and accepting it. We have to help God help us. We can't just sit here and say, well, what have you done for me lately? You can't just mail it in. We are called to participate in the life of God through faith, hope, love, etc., so that we are accepting the help God is constantly and faithfully giving us. And then, can you imagine how weary the man must have been? The whole town? Now, the whole town might have been 20 people. More likely, it was 120. How long would it have been to go around and touch everyone, hear this much of their story, and then pray? Now, it was Jesus, so we have this illusion or idea that well, he, all he had to do was say, be healed. And it may not have taken long. But if he's compassionate and personal, he's taking at least a couple of minutes with every person. He had to have a real short night of sleep because we're told early the next day, before dawn, he got up to go pray. Here's the other side of Jesus, the contemplative, or you could say the passive side. He's yielding to the Father. He needed to go and strengthen or nourish himself, whatever word might be used, strengthen himself, refresh himself in the communion with the Father to see what the Father's thinking about it all and I suppose to get direction for the day forward. 
Jesus could easily have said, okay, well, everybody's looking for me. Well, let's go. They must need something. No, he says, I suspect from his prayer, we're going to other towns, for this is the purpose for which I came. The practical side of that is Jesus would have been possessed. Hey, we're never letting you go because now you're here and we'd like you being here because you heal everybody. We're never letting you go. There comes the eternal high priest. He is the high priest of all creation, all humanity, and all persons. As we pray then today, <coughs> be mindful not only of the incarnation of Jesus, but yours. You are blood and flesh. But similarly, going the other direction, you're also called to become divine by our participation in Christ. We're not made God, I've said that before, but we share the divine nature because we believe in Christ and try to imitate him in our lives. In light of that compassion, by the grace of the Spirit, may God make it so.